I'm Martin Moore, Director of the Media Standards Trust, here with Clive Stafford-Smith, the Legal Director of the UK charity Reprieve and author of Bad Men, Guantanamo Bay and the Secret Prisons. Hello, Clive. Hi. Um, would you, you're shortlisted for the Orwell Prize um, for political writing. Uh, would you consider yourself primarily a writer? Oh no, I'm an amateur. I mean, I'm very flattered to be amongst uh, such obviously professional names, but I'm not a writer. I, I did go to college in America with a passion to be a journalist at one point, but I found a way to sink even lower in the public estimation by becoming a lawyer. On the other hand, what we do in terms of representing prisoners around the world in Guantanamo and other secret prisons there isn't really a court of law that you have much chance of getting any justice from, and the court of public opinion is the place that we do have a chance of persuading the powers that be to behave themselves. So that is the forum that, uh, that we work in more, perhaps, than the courts. So how did you come to write this book? You know, I've always been a frustrated author. I wrote a rubbish book when I was quite young, which I will never publish. I shall perhaps let my grandchildren read it one day. But, um, but I've always wanted to, and here, there's a catharsis to the whole process. It's actually very frustrating um, visiting the prisoners in Guantanamo where everything that they tell me is secret and I come out of there, I'm not allowed to tell you, I'm not allowed to tell my wife. And that's very frustrating and so we have these battles to unclassify material and it's, it comes out in dribs and drabs and you don't get a very full picture. And then you see on the other side that the Bush administration, regardless of what their own rules of classification are, goes issuing press releases willy-nilly. I, I referred to it in Guantanamo one time to a journalist there as their propaganda tour of Guantanamo, which is a word I like to repeat as often as possible because they threaten me with locking me up down there and tossing me off the island for using the word propaganda. It is propaganda. And I wanted to write something that put the other side. I don't pretend that I have uh, a monopoly on the truth, but I think there's a lot more truth in my version of Guantanamo than, than the government. You've, you've, been, you've been a lawyer and you've been representing um, prisoners on death row for, for decades now, and you've been representing um, prisoners at Guantanamo for going on for almost five years. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not only how did you, you write this novel, when did you write this, this, <laughs> this book, not novel? Uh, yeah, so don't refer to it as a novel. Uh, that's, what the, uh, that's what the administration, the Bush administration, probably refers to it as. I like to think it's uh, a fact. The, I, I wrote it you know, late at night and on different trips, and a lot of it actually comes up as you're representing people. It's, it's remarkably easy, really, to, to write something when you're working on it every day because it's part of what you're doing. I think it's much harder for people to write when they have to go out and research it all from the start. I was just living it. You, you describe in the book in some detail uh, the, the, the torture which um, some of your clients um, uh, uh, talk to you about, um, particularly a young man called Binyam, um, uh, tortured in Afghanistan and then subsequently in Morocco um, before going to, to Guantanamo. Um, how did you discover some of the details of this torture, and particularly, ha have you been able to verify it? Binyam's case is remarkable. I've got to say, when I went to law school in America many, many years ago now, it never occurred to me that I was going to be sitting across the table from someone from Britain talking to that person about how he had been tortured by United States personnel. It was just incredible. I saw Binyam for the first time in early 2005, and sometimes it's very difficult to establish trust with the prisoners in Guantanamo for, for many, many reasons. And Binyam has not been easy, but I'll tell you, the first time I saw him, I saw him for three days straight, and we just sat there, and he told me his story basically from beginning to end, and I sat there listening to him and taking notes for three days. And it was as draining as any experience I've ever had to listen to him talk about being rendered to Morocco, um, having a razor blade taken to his penis, all sorts of you know, horrendous things that should be left in the Middle Ages where they belong. Now, you know, I think after a while you do have a pretty good sense as to whether people are telling you the truth when you spend enough time with them. On the other hand, it's also important to establish their credibility. So with Binyam, for example, 
I didn't know when I went to see him anything uh, about his case. I knew nothing about how he'd been rendered, but I got him to give me all the dates and all the details of it. Then when I came out, I have to submit all my notes through the census. So you get these notes out that say unclassified on them with the particular date. And then I could cross check them when, when, when actually a journalist, Stephen Gray, got his hands on the flight logs of the CIA rendition planes. And so the dates and times and descriptions of personnel on that rendition plane where Binyam was taken first in July 2002 to Morocco matched identically to the records when we came out. And that doesn't prove everything he says is true, but it certainly proves that that's true. And I've found absolutely nothing so far that disputes Binyam's version of the story and a lot that corroborates it. And it's, it's just shocking that we're, we're having this discussion in this day and age.